Have you ever wished that you could speak to somebody who would tell you what is the meaning of reality? That is, have you ever wished, oh, I wish I could just talk to some man or some woman whom I could trust and who knew what the meaning of life was or why we're here or what the whole thing is in aid of? Have you ever thought that? I think all of us have, especially as we see the world beginning to be more and more chaotic and life becoming more and more meaningless. We think, oh, it would just be good to know what the point of it all is. And I wish we could talk to somebody who knew. The difficulty, of course, is that however clever our politicians are, however wise our prime minister is, however insightful our teachers or our great scholars are, however deep or shrewd or clever our Einsteins are, none of them seem to be able to have the background or, uh, to be able to give us an authoritative explanation of what happened before the world ever existed or what will happen ever the, after the world ceases to exist. All of them seem tied in the same way as we ourselves are to 70 or 90 years here on this planet, and that's it. Then they go out like a light. That is, all of them, including Confucius, Zoroaster, all the rest of the religious leaders, all of them except one remarkable man that appeared, it seemed, from outer space on our planet about 1900 years ago. And, of course, that's why we have Christmas. And it's not a vague mythological legend that Christmas is based on. It's based on the hard historical evidence of about 4,000 Greek manuscripts that there lived 1,900 years ago, probably born about the year 5 or 6 BC, a man called Jesus and that he lived for maybe 30 or 33 years and then died, was actually executed in 29 AD and said before he was executed that he was really more than an ordinary human being, that uh, the perfection that he showed in his own moral life and his ability to calm a storm on a lake and raise a man from the dead came from the fact that he was not just an ordinary human being, but he was really the son of the being that made our universe. And he said to prove that to us, he was going to allow himself to be executed and then was going to come back to life again. In fact, that's exactly what he did. He came back to life and lived for more than a month and appeared before enemies and friends alike uh, on a, about 13 different occasions and showed that he had the ability to go through the barrier of death and to come back whenever he wanted. And then he disappeared from the earth. And though the bones of Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest have been able to be found and dug up, this man's bones never have been found because he disappeared from the earth. He actually rose up from the ground. And what we have been studying is, of course, the evidence that this is so, because, after all, it doesn't happen every day. And so we've been trying all the old chestnuts that we learned when we were at school, all the old alternative explanations to the resurrection of this man Jesus from the dead, in order to prove that he didn't rise from the dead. But we found the same as everybody has found who has tried to do that, that the explanations are more difficult to believe than the actual historical fact of the resurrection itself. And this is particularly so when we come to the second great fact. The first great fact is the empty tomb. The second great fact is the appearances that took place after he came back from being dead. I mean, he did show himself to be alive. Some of us, of course, take the usual old psychological route. We say, oh, well, that's easy. They were just hallucinations. Those appearances, those times they appeared to people, they were just hallucinations. They were just imagining, uh, people imagining that he was alive, imagining that they could see him again. But there are some difficulties involved in that, you know. Uh, that theory that uh, his appearances are just hallucinations faces real difficulties once you begin to examine it on the basis of psychology. 
it's uh, plausible uh, that he uh, just uh, created hallucinations in the minds of his followers until we begin to realize that modern medicine has observed that certain laws apply to such psychological phenomena. In other words, there are laws that govern hallucinations. And as we relate those principles of hallucinations to the evidence that we have in history, we see that what at first seemed most plausible is in fact impossible. That is, it seems at first, oh yes, hallucinations is the explanation of the appearances, but as we begin to examine them in the light of psychological theory and psychological research, we begin to find, no, it's not so easy to believe that there were hallucinations. For instance, hallucinations occur generally in people who tend to be vividly imaginative and of a nervous makeup. But the appearances of Jesus were to all sorts of people. For instance, you can't think of big, bluff, honest Peter, a down-to-earth fisherman that earned his money by the sweat of his brow in a boat, that he was a nervous, kind of imaginative, poetic type. Nor can you believe that about shrewd, clever Paul, nor about James or John or the other disciples who were ordinary fishermen. They were ordinary working men. They were not psychologically shrewd and theoretical philosophers. They were down-to-earth ordinary people. They weren't the kind of people that gave in to nervous feelings or to imaginative experiences. Moreover, hallucinations are extremely subjective and individual. For this reason, no two people have the same experience. But in the case of the resurrection, Jesus appeared not just to individuals, but to groups, including on one occasion more than 500 people at one time. Paul says that more than half of them were still alive and could tell about those events. Even as he wrote about them, he said, more than half of these people are still around and can testify that they actually did see this man alive. And all of them couldn't have had an hallucination because one of the laws that govern hallucinations is they occur to one person and they're very subjective. Moreover, hallucinations usually occur only at particular times and places and are associated with the events that are fancied. But the appearances of this man Jesus occurred both indoors and outdoors, in the morning and the afternoon and in the evening, at all kinds of different times, not at just certain peculiar times. Generally, these psychic experiences occur over a long period of time with some regularity. So hallucinations generally occur over a long extended period of time and regularly. But the appearances of Jesus happened during a period of just 40 days and then stopped abruptly. No one ever said they happened again. So his appearances do not fit these laws that govern hallucinations. But perhaps the most conclusive indication of the fallacy of the hallucinations theory is a fact that's often overlooked. In order to have an experience like this, one must so intensely want to believe that he projects something that really isn't there and attaches reality to his imagination. So you must want to believe that. For instance, a mother who has just lost a son in the war remembers how he used to come home from work every evening at 5.30. She sits in her rocking chair every afternoon, musing and meditating. Finally, she thinks she sees him come through the door and has a conversation with him. At this point, she has lost contact with reality. That's normally the way a hallucination occurs. It occurs to somebody who wants and expects it to happen. The fact is, the very opposite of this took place in the appearances of Jesus. The disciples were persuaded against their wills that Jesus had risen from the dead. Mary came to the tomb on the first Easter Sunday morning with spices in her hands. Why? To anoint the dead body of the Lord she loved. She was obviously not expecting to find him risen from the dead. In fact, when she first saw him, she mistook him for the gardener. It was only after he spoke to her and identified himself that she realized who, she, who he was. In other words, his disciples didn't expect him to rise from the dead. They had given up any hope of that. When the other disciples heard, they didn't believe. The story seemed to them just an idle tale. And when Jesus finally appeared to the disciples, they were frightened and thought they had seen a ghost. So they didn't expect him to rise from the dead at all. But hallucinations require that people want and expect the man to appear to them. This wasn't so with Jesus.
Are there any other reasons for believing that he actually did rise from the dead and these weren't hallucinations? Yes, there are some more. Let's talk about them tomorrow.